You've most certainly experienced this situation once. You take a great picture with your friend and someone is photobombing behind you, ruining your future Instagram post. Well, that's no longer an issue. Either it's a person or a trash can you forgot to remove before taking your selfie that's ruining your picture, this AI will automatically remove the undesired object or person in the image and save your post. It's just like a professional Photoshop designer in your pocket with a simple click. This task of removing part of an image and replacing it with what should appear behind it has been tackled by many AI researchers for a long time. It's called image and painting, and it's extremely challenging. As we will see, the paper I want to show you achieves it with incredible results and can do it easily in high definition, unlike previous approaches you may have heard of before. You definitely want to stay until the end of the video to see that. You won't believe how great and realistic it looks for something produced in a split second by an algorithm. As I said, this task of image and painting is basically you removing unwanted objects from your images. You should be doing the same in your work life and remove any friction. Your next step as an AR professional or student to do that should be to do like me and try the sponsor of today's episode, Weights and Biases. If you run a lot of experiments, you should be using Weights and Biases. It will remove all painful steps from hyperparameter tuning to results analysis with a handful of lines of code added and it's entirely free for personal usage. It takes not even 5 minutes to set up and you don't have anything else to do forever. Talking about removing friction points, I don't think you can do better than that. Weights and Biases has everything you need for your code to be reproducible without you even trying. For your well-being, do like me and give Weights and Biases a try for free with the first link below. To remove an object from an image, the machine needs to understand what should appear behind this object. And to do this will require having a three-dimensional understanding of the world as humans do. But it doesn't have that. It just has access to a few pixels in an image, which is why it's so complicated. Whereas it looks quite simple for us that can simply imagine the depth and guess that there should be the rest of the wall, here the window, and etc. We basically need to teach the machine how the world typically looks like. So we will do that using a lot of examples of real world images so that it can have an idea of what our world looks like in the two dimensional picture world, which is not a perfect approach, but does the job. Then another problem comes with the computational cost of using real world images with way too many pixels. To fix that, most current approaches work with low quality images, so a downsized version of the image that is manageable for our computers, and upscale the unpainted part at the end to replace it in the original image, making the final results look worse than it could be. Or at least, they won't look great enough to be shared on Instagram and have all the likes you deserve. You can't really feed it high quality images directly as it will take way too much time to process and train. Or can you? Well, these are the main problems the researchers attacked in this paper, and here's how. Roman Suvarov et al. from Samsung Research introduced a new network called LAMA that is quite particular. As you can see, in image and painting, you will typically send the initial image as well as what you'd like to remove from it. This is called a mask and will cover the image, as you can see here, and the network won't have access to this information anymore as it needs to fill in the pixels. Then, it has to understand the image and try to fill in the same pixels it thinks should fit best. So in this case, they start like any other network and downscale the image. But don't worry, their technique will allow them to keep the same quality as a high resolution image. This is because here in the processing of the image, they use something a bit different than usual. Typically, we can see different networks here in the middle, mostly convolutional neural networks. Such networks are often used on images due to how convolutions work, which I explained in other videos, like the one appearing on the top right of your screen if you are interested in how it works. In short, the network will work in two steps. First, it will compress the image and try to only save relevant information. The network will end up conserving mostly the general information about the image, like its color, overall style, or general object appearing, but not precise details. Then, it will try to reconstruct the image using the same principles but backward. We use some tricks like skip connections that will save information from the first few layers of the network and pass it along the second step so that it can orient it towards the right objects. 
In short, it easily knows that there's a tower with a blue sky and trees, called Global Information. But it needs the skip connections to know that it's the Eiffel Tower in the middle of the screen, that there are clouds here and there, the trees have these colors, etc. All the fine-grained details which we call Local Information. Following a long training with many examples, we will expect our network to reconstruct the image, or at least a very similar image, that contains the same kind of objects and be very similar if not identical to the initial image. But remember, in this case we are working with low quality images that we need to upscale, which will hurt the quality of the results. The particularity here is that instead of using convolutions as in regular convolutional networks and skip connections to keep local knowledge, it uses what we call the Fast Fourier Convolution, or FFC. This means that the network will work in both the spatial and frequency domains, and doesn't need to get back to the early layers to understand the context of the image. Each layer will work with convolutions in the spatial domain to process local features, and use Fourier convolutions in the frequency domain to analyze global features. The frequency domain is a bit special, and I linked a great video covering it in the description below if you are curious. It will basically transform your image into all possible frequencies just like sound waves and tell you how much of each frequency the image contains. So each new pixel of this newly created image will represent a frequency covering the whole spatial image and how much it is present, instead of colors. The frequencies here are just the repeated patterns at different scales. For example, one of these frequency pixels could be highly activated by the vertical lines at a specific distance from each other. In this case, it could be the same distance as the length of a brick. So it will be highly activated if there's a brick wall in the image. From this, you'd understand that there's probably a brick wall and the size proportional to how much it is activated. And you can repeat this for all pixels being activated for similar patterns, giving you good hints of the overall aspect of the image, but nothing about the object themselves or the colors. The spatial domain will take charge of this. So doing convolutions on this new Fourier image allows you to work with the whole image at each step of the convolution process. So it has access to a much better global understanding of the image even at early layers without much computational cost, which is impossible to achieve with regular convolutions in the spatial domain. Then, both global and local results are saved and sent to the next layer which will repeat these steps. You will end up with the final image that you can upscale back. The use of the Fourier domain is what makes it scalable to bigger images as their image resolution doesn't affect the Fourier domain since it uses frequencies over the whole image instead of colors. And the repeated pattern it's looking for will be the same whatever the size of the image. Meaning that even with training this network with small images, you will be able to feed it much larger images afterward and get amazing results. As you can see, the results are not perfect, but they are quite impressive and I'm excited to see what they will do next to improve them. Of course, this was just a simple overview of this new model and you can find more detail about the implementation in the paper linked in the description below. You can also implement it yourself with the code linked below as well. I hope you enjoyed the video and if so, please take a second to share it with a friend that could find this interesting. It will mean a lot and help this channel grow. Thank you for watching.